Electricity American Jobs Plan. You're a little bit early, so just hang tight and the program should be starting soon. Um, that you cannot actually see each other because it's a, a Zoom webinar, but I can see all your names and it's looking like a really great group of folks. I can tell you that much. My name is Jamie DeMarco. I'm the Federal Policy Director for the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, and I just want to start by saying this. On March 31st of this year, Biden unveiled his American Jobs Plan. It is a multi-trillion dollar investment into climate solutions and infrastructure, and it requires 100% clean electricity by 2035. This will utterly transform Maryland and our ability to act on climate justice. Um, our speakers are gonna lay out for us exactly how this plan is gonna benefit Maryland, benefit us specifically as a state, and what we can do to help get it passed. First, we're gonna hear from John King, who is the founder of the organizational co-host of tonight's event, Strong Future Maryland. He also served as the Secretary of Education under the Obama administration. Then we're going to hear from the incredible president of the University of Maryland, President Pines, who recently committed to making University of Maryland net zero by 2025. You heard that right, it is 2025, none of this 45 business 2025. Then we're gonna hear from our two U.S. Senators from Maryland, Senator Van Hollen and Senator Cardin, both of whom have been tirelessly and effectively serving Maryland for decades. And we are so, so grateful to have both of them joining today. And finally, um, we're going to hear from the one and only Delegate Charcutian, who is going to tell us what all of this means, this package means for Maryland's ability to pass ambitious climate legislation. So first I want to briefly go over what is in the Biden American Jobs Plan? And let's start by watching this short video. Do we have the video queued up? The American Jobs Plan will lead 
to a transformational progress in our effort to tackle climate change, creating good paying jobs by leading the world in the manufacturing and export of clean electric cars and trucks. The federal government owns an enormous fleet of vehicles, which are going to be transitioned to clean electric vehicles. My American Jobs Plan will put hundreds of thousands of people to work, building a modern, resilient, and fully clean grid. It's the biggest increase in our federal research and development spending on record. It's going to boost America's innovative edge in markets like battery technology. The proposal I put forward will create millions of jobs. And by the way, no one making under $400,000 will see their federal taxes go up, period. If we act now, in 50 years, people are going to look back and say, this was the moment that America won the future. Wow, that was a great video, really had a lot of content. If you didn't write down all those numbers, that's okay. I'm just going to briefly go over what is in the uh, Biden American Jobs Plan. Um, and you can also check out the, the, the information in this fact sheet, which we're dropping in the chat right now, which includes all of the provisions which reduce emissions. And they include, again, 100% clean electricity by 2035, coupled with $400 billion in direct investments to build wind and solar, $213 billion to build millions of efficient, zero emission, affordable housing units, $174 billion for electric vehicle adoption, 85 billion to improve our public transportation, 80 billion for railroads, 35 billion for research and development, 27 billion for sustainability accelerators in communities that have not yet benefited from the clean energy industry, 20 billion to make communities more walkable and bikeable, 10 billion for a civilian climate core, and much, much more. And I didn't even go through all the climate provisions. Again, you can read them on that fact sheet. The plan also invests 40% of all this money into disadvantaged communities replaces every lead pipe in America, protects the right to unionize, and more. So I want to hear from our guests now about what this means for Maryland. Without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to John King, founder of Strong Future Maryland. Strong Future Maryland is co-host of this event and already a leader in making Maryland a more equitable and low emission state. He also, of course, served as the Secretary of Education under the Obama administration. Thanks so much, Jamie. We're thrilled at Sean Future Maryland to partner with CKIN on this event and always honored to join our two fantastic senators and President Pines and of course my delegate, Delegate Charcutian. So let me let me start with this context. You know, I, I was a kid whose life was saved by public schools. My parents passed away when I was uh, a kid. My mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And I've always believed that public institutions can be a force for good in people's lives. And this is a moment where the Biden administration is saying government can be a force for good in people's lives by delivering good jobs and making tremendous progress on climate action and environmental justice. So I'm deeply passionate about making sure this American Jobs Plan happens. It's also an opportunity, I think, for us in Maryland to address some missed opportunities we've had, some missed opportunities to invest in infrastructure, like the terrible decision to cancel the Red Line project in Baltimore City, missed opportunities to leverage our higher ed institutions and our research institutions to drive economic growth in the state, uh, missed opportunities to tackle climate change in a state where we have a huge amount of interior coastland, where we've already got saltwater intrusion on the eastern shore. We've got flooding regularly in, in Howard County. We've got some of the worst asthma rates in the country in Baltimore City. Uh, we've missed opportunities to tackle climate change and environmental justice. This gives us a chance to do big things. A few things that I think are really important about this proposal from President Biden. One, lots of good jobs, good jobs, good union jobs in a variety of industries from uh, building bridges to rail to uh, addressing clean water, which is a huge challenge. The president is rightly focused on the fact that we've got 10 million homes in America that have pipes with lead in them, not to mention 400,000 schools and child care centers with lead pipes. This is an opportunity to tackle uh, the issue of clean water. Uh, this is an opportunity to build the charging stations we need as we move towards electric vehicles. Uh, this is an opportunity to engage farmers in planting cover crops that will help us meet 
the challenge of combating carbon dioxide in the air. So there's a lot of opportunity here just to create good jobs. That's job one for this bill. But there's also an opportunity here to tackle the role that schools play in climate change. There's over $100 billion to address upgrading school buildings. There's uh, $12 billion for community colleges, $25 billion for child care centers. That facilities work can be done in a way that moves us towards the use of geothermal for heat, moves us towards the use of solar for power, um, moves us towards the creation of kitchens in the facilities so that we can, we can prepare food in ways that make more sense for people's health and the health of our environment. Uh, there's also an opportunity here to improve workforce development, to make investments in our higher ed institutions and job training programs, to prepare people for good green jobs in renewable energy, good mitigation jobs like weatherization, uh, which, which we know will be critical, and electrification, uh, which we know is critical to help us get to net zero faster. Um, there's also an opportunity here to help people transition from old jobs that are going away to new jobs that are actually better for them and better for the environment. So we know coal-fired power plants are going away. Uh, and what we need to do is make sure the folks who work there have access to good jobs. There's actually funding dedicated in the American Jobs Plan, $40 billion for a dislocated workers program that will provide job training so we can help people successfully transition. There's also targeted funding for violence prevention and programs for folks who are formerly incarcerated. Think about the opportunities to help folks who don't have access to, to uh, good jobs, can't support their families now to get the training they need to enter into good green jobs that then allow them to successfully support their families and help us build stronger, safer communities. There's also funding here targeted to HBCUs. We know we have a troubled history in the state around uh, providing adequate resources to our HBCUs. This bill includes provisions to create centers of research excellence at HBCUs. There is a lot to love about this bill, but there's even more. There's a commitment to the conversion of 20% of the bus fleet to electric. And, and we know we have 480,000 school buses in, in the United States. They are today contributing to air pollution. The move to, to electric buses will allow us to make progress not only on our net zero goal, but on our goal of having a healthy environment with clean air that we can all breathe. Before I wrap up, I do want to say that we have to couple all the great opportunities in the American Jobs Plan with the great investments that are proposed in the American Family Plan. Everything from free community college to investments in our HBCUs and MSIs, early childhood investments. So together, this package is really a statement the government can be not only a force for good in people's lives, but can help us to build a much stronger, more just, more prosperous future. So uh, thrilled to be a part of this conversation, thrilled to partner with CCAN to work to make sure that we pass the American Jobs Plan. Thank you so much for that. I, I love that tying in of education. I think our next speaker is gonna have something to say about that, but I first want to acknowledge that we are now officially joined um, by the Honorable Senator Chris Van Hollen. Um, and I think next we're gonna hear, and hey, thanks so much for joining Senator. We're going to hear quickly from Senator Pines, um, who is of course the president of the University of Maryland. He was previously faculty on the University of Maryland James Clark School of Engineering since 1995. He served 11 years as the Dean. In 2019, he was elected National Academy of Engineering um, and as president, he's already committed the school to net zero 2025 and launched a $40 million new initiative to recruit and retain faculty from underserved represented backgrounds. Um, please, President Pines. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, it's an honor to be included uh, with this distinguished group of, of panelists. Uh, Dr. King, we thank you for your service to our country as Secretary of Education. Senators Cardin and Van Hollen, uh, can't say a word about you, your work here in the state of Maryland and for the nation as well. And to our own delegate, uh, Charcutian, thank you for the work that you do also in the state of Maryland. Um, as Jamie just mentioned, I announced last week that the University of Maryland College Park would li literally become, by Earth Day 2025, net zero carbon neutral campus. 
and convert also our fossil fuel vehicles to all electric by 2035. Now, I had no idea that the Biden administration would be uh, in alignment with me on some of these dates. And so I'm super excited about uh, the American Jobs Plan and because it would have a significant impact on research universities like the University of Maryland. This plan proposes one of the most significant investments in federal R&D in history of academia. $50 billion for a new directorate at the National Science Foundation for Youth-Inspired Research and Translation, focused with the primary focus on, climate, on the climate crisis. $14 billion for the National Institutes of Standards and Technology to advance technologies critical to our competitiveness. $5 billion in additional funding for research focus on purely climate change and the creation, the creation of a new agency called ARPA Climate or ARPA C, modeled off the historic DARPA or ARPA E, which has done really well to translate technologies to products to business to advance the United States. So this is the incredible model that we're trying to replicate. This level of investment in R&D, specifically in the development of clean energy technology, will be critical, as Dr. King mentioned, to moving the country to 100% clean energy standard by 2035, as proposed in this plan. The University of Maryland is, is a research powerhouse and a leader in clean energy R&D, especially in groundbreaking battery technology, as Senator Van Hollen is very much aware of, advanced materials and technologies that capture and store carbon, among other technologies that will be important to moving towards a clean energy standard. So I strongly support this surge of funding in federal R&D programs that will not only help to address climate change, but launch new industries and create jobs in Maryland and across the country for all citizens. In addition, I was also very, very pleased to see that the American Jobs Plan includes $40 billion for research infrastructure. This is extremely important. You know, following World War II and after the Soviet launched Sputnik in 1957, the United States government began heavily investing in scientific infrastructure programs to support construction and renovation of research facilities and equipment. But many of the programs launched during this era ended by the early 1970s and the federal contributions for research at the nation's colleges dropped significantly. This neglect of the physical infrastructure for research threatens the long-term vitality of the US scientific enterprise, especially given the significant investments made by, by Asian and European nations in recent years. Just to provide one example, one example, Congress supported a program called the NIST Construction Grant Program at the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in 2009 during the Obama period for the stimulus bill. Through that program, NIST was able to invest hundreds of millions of dollars of federal funds in new and renovated scientific facilities at research universities like mine across the country in critical emerging technologies like quantum, AI, and advanced nanocomposite materials. Now, awardees for these funds reported that they, were to, they hired an additional 114 researchers, they submitted 201 patents, and they had an additional 82 new patents under development. At the University of Maryland, I'm just gonna tell you why this is so important, this, this little program at NIST on infrastructure. We received a grant through this program to complete our physical science complex, which houses our joint quantum um, institute with quantum laboratories. If we did not get those stimulus funds back in 2009, today, the firm called INQ, which was started and translated from labs of research in our quantum facilities, which is now the first pure play publicly traded quantum computing firm in the, in the world, right here in College Park, right here at the University of Maryland, right here in the state of Maryland. Now, why is this important to the climate situation? One of the challenges in modeling climate physics is the computational power you have. It turns out today's supercomputers are just simply not fast enough nor comprehensive enough to allow us to do the full modeling to come up with climate solutions. This new technology of quantum computers can do it in milliseconds. And so this is gonna advance solutions to climate. This is why investment in research infrastructure is so important and why the American Jobs Plan is so critical to invest in research universities like the University of Maryland and to advance even the own state of Maryland's interest and in climate research to help advance our climate solutions. So quantum is important. 
and we're uh, very happy. And we, so we hope Congress will again support funding scientific infrastructure, which is a key to addressing the biggest challenges of our time, including climate change. And as Dr. King mentioned, uh, developing the workforce of the future and launching new industries right here in the state of Maryland and in the United States. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Pines, for laying out how the last stimulus is paying dividends today. Can't wait to see 10 years from now what this stimulus um, pays out to be. And now it is my great honor to introduce the incredible Senator Chris Van Hollen. He is a tried and true climate champion, as well as a champion on other critical issues. He now serves on the all-important Finance Committee in the U.S. Senate. and We anticipate he's going to have a big hand in crafting and enacting the American Jobs Plan. His policy expertise and leadership skills make his role in the Senate absolutely indispensable. Please welcome Senator Chris Van Hollen. Well, Jamie, thank you. It's great to be uh, with you and with Kirsten and Mike uh, and the entire CCAN team. And let me start by thanking all of you at CCAN for really putting Maryland uh, on a map uh, as a leader in our effort to uh, cut carbon emissions um, and move to a sustainable energy uh, future. And uh, our goal now is to make uh, America follow Maryland's example that you have set for it, including uh, Delegate Charcutian. Thank you for your leadership um, as part of that effort. And I want to say to President Pines, thank you for your great leadership at University of Maryland, including your recent announcement about your um, your carbon pollution reduction goals and your 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 net emissions. Uh, target. Um, that's leading by example, and we're grateful for all the work uh, that you're doing. Uh, to Secretary John King, uh, thank you for all you did uh, as Secretary of Education and your continuing contributions to our debate in so many, many uh, areas. And I know we're going to be joined uh, later by my partner and colleague, uh, uh, Ben Cardin. And, and let me just say, Jamie, so I'm on the Appropriations Committee. We spend the money. Ben's on the Finance Committee where they raise the money. I'm also on the budget committee, uh, though, and banking and housing. So between us, we do cover uh, all the key touch points uh, when it comes to uh, climate change. Now, uh, Senator Cardin and I, a uh, little earlier today, uh, we were together uh, at m and Stadium with the Vice President of the United States, uh, Kamala Harris, uh, where we talked about the accomplishments of the last 100 days, including over 220 million vaccines in arms. Uh, but we said that we're just getting started. And uh, while we pull out of this emergency, we really have to do the better part of the build back better in the Biden plan. And that, of course, is what uh, the president spoke about last night uh, in the joint session of Congress. Um, it was refreshing uh, to have a, a president of the United States there who understood the huge threat uh, we're facing from climate change. But more importantly, the huge opportunities we have. I mean, we know the costs of inaction are staggering, but we also know the opportunities for action are great. And that is why the president is so focused on jobs, clean energy jobs. And that's why he's rolled out uh, a program uh, to get us there in the American uh, Jobs Act. I'm not gonna go through all, all the details of that plan. I'm going to tick off a couple things, um, including he has a 10 year extension of very important tax incentives for clean energy generation storage. Uh, President Pines managed, mentioned that the battery storage is such an important piece. China has been way ahead of us. We need to catch up and get ahead. Uh, there, there are also grants and incentives for charging infrastructure. You know, we've had this um, chicken and egg question for a long time, electric cars, how do you charge them? Well, we need to make sure we have charging stations, you know, so they have to be replacing those gas stations so people feel comfortable that uh, when they get in their car for a long drive, they'll be able to uh, refuel with clean electricity. Uh, we also uh, have as that bill a number of incentives uh, to deal with uh, green buildings, uh, something I worked on when I was in the Maryland legislature, but we need to do that at scale nationally. Uh, there are also other uh, tax credits like the 48C tax credit for domestic clean energy manufacturing. But the thing I wanna focus most on, uh, Jamie and everybody who's joining this call and thank all of you for being part of this, is the 100% clean electricity standard by the year 2035. Because setting a national standard like that then drives 
innovation uh, because everybody out there in the country, in the marketplace, um, has to work to achieve uh, that standard. And that will, it will cut carbon emissions dramatically. Um, it will reduce electricity uh, costs, and it really will help generate a lot of the, the, the push uh, for a clean energy economy. Uh, we already see 30 states um, require some degree of clean electricity. Again, thank you, CCAM, for what you've done in Maryland. Eight states mandate a 100% conversion to wind, solar, and other clean sources in the coming years. Uh, and if you look at them collectively, uh, that has helped generate over two and a half million jobs. And that's just doing it state level. Doing this nationally, we can really address uh, the job opportunities issue. And in that vein, I wanna mention one other thing, which is um, I proposed for many years um, uh, something called the Green Bank. Um, and Ed Markey and I introduced uh, this year something called the National Climate Bank. What is that? Um, it's, a, it's a national financing um, engine uh, that would be very focused on clean energy projects, but also helping uh, in communities that have been left behind and have been the most victimized by pollution uh, in our country. And so it's estimated that for every dollar we put in this uh, green bank or national climate bank, or now we're calling it just a clean energy accelerator, Every dollar you put in that will generate about five to seven dollars of private investment. Again, channeled, targeted toward our goals. Um, now there are some clean uh, energy uh, these accelerators in Maryland already. Um, Montgomery County was one of the actually earliest jurisdictions in the country uh, to launch one. But taking this to scale, we need to do it at the national level. And I am pleased that the the Biden plan uh, has about thirty billion dollars in it, the American Jobs Plan. For this purpose, we'd like to get it to $100 billion. Finally, I wanna thank CCAN and especially Mike Tidwell. He and I have teamed up for years uh, to pass a cap and dividend bill uh, that would effectively put a price on carbon, but address the very real concerns about higher costs for certain uh, families um, by rebating 100% Dividend, taking that dividend from taxing the big polluters and using those funds to return to every American uh, with a social security number. Now, this is not part of the Biden plan right now. I don't know whether this will fit in along the way, but I do wanna thank uh, CCAN for having pushed this idea because at the end of the day, like a clean energy standard, Having national, national signals, whether through standards and or price on pollution, um, we, we can get there faster uh, along with these other important investments. So let me, let me end there. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions, Jamie. Thank you for all your, your work as the outreach uh, director for CCAN. Oh, well, we are so glad to have you. And we are also joined um, now by Senator Cardin, who we will get to hear from in a moment. But first, Senator uh, Van Hollen, we have some questions coming in in the chat. And this first one is part of a kind of a two-part question. What aspects of this, can, of the American jobs plan um, do you think could pass through reconciliation if necessary? And what parts do you think would pass through your committee, the Appropriations Committee? Well, um, very good question. And Senator Cardin and I were just at a meeting earlier today with some of the other members of the Senate Democratic Caucus, you know, talking about different options. Um, you know, we agree with President Biden that uh, we should try to get Republicans on board if possible, because if we do, then you don't have to go through reconciliation and you don't um, have what we call bird droppings, which are the provisions uh, that. Senator Byrd um, said we're not compliant uh, with reconciliation. Certain policy provisions could potentially drop out. So for example, we're gonna have to be very creative about trying to get a clean energy standard through the reconciliation process, which is why it's best if we can get more Republicans on board. But at the same time, I think we've heard from people like Mitch McConnell, I, I must say I'm, I'm not a 
I'm, I'm an optimist usually, but not necessarily an optimist here. So we do need to begin now to plan on how we're going to go through the reconciliation process, even as we work to try to bring Republicans on board. And, and the simple answer, and it's the, this is all a question for the parliamentarian at the end of the day, she becomes the most popular and, and powerful person uh, in the Senate, is if there's a, a, a nexus to the budget, um, then, and, and if that's the main thing. So investing in, in certain areas uh, is, is budget related. Um, if it's an existing sort of tax structure, you can certainly grow it. Um, where, where you get in trouble is if the budget purpose or the tax purpose is seen as really tangential to a larger policy purpose. Um, so that, that is, uh, again, it's an imperfect science, but um, there, there, there may be, you know, there, there are going to be some policies that are going to be harder to craft in a way that survives uh, the reconciliation process. Just for the record, my view is we should just get rid of the filibuster and, and not worry about uh, these kind of carve outs um, for our, I think we should allow democracy to work its will. Well, we agree completely with you on the filibuster front. What do you think Marylanders can do to help this pass and help it pass in the strongest version? Things like getting that green, uh, that ex energy accelerator up from 30 billion to 100 billion. I think the main thing you can do is, you know, reach out to your, your allied groups um, around the country, uh, develop an agenda as to what your, you know, top priorities that you want to focus on uh, would be. Um, and then, you know, get people to unify uh, and press their, their senators uh, to do this. Um, and as, we're, as we've been talking, they're sort of the, the dual strategy. I mean, uh, you know, we, we'd like to get Republicans on board, but we're not gonna wait forever, just like we didn't wait forever on the American Rescue Plan. I mean, if we waited to get, you know, you know a filibuster proof majority, we would, we would not have the American Rescue Plan in place today. So, you know, sooner rather than later, we need to shift toward uh, reconciliation. And what all of you can do then is focus on getting the Democratic Senate caucus um, all in a good place uh, in a positive way. Thank you, Senator. I know you have a hard stop at 730, so we can let you join. Thank you again so much uh, for all the work that you do. Uh, well, it's great to, great to be with you. And, and thanks so much uh, to you and everybody. This is uh, a great moment of opportunity for our country, we just need to seize it. So thank you. Thank you. And next, I just can't believe how lucky we are to be joined not by one, but two Maryland US senators. Next, I get to introduce Senator Ben Cardin, who is a top leader in the US Senate and serves as the chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Subcommittee of the Environment and Public Works Committee. So in his role as that committee chair, we think he's gonna have a very big uh, role to play in shaping the Biden American Jobs Plan. Um, Senator Cardin is joining by phone tonight, so you're not going to see his video. Um, but Senator, I think, oh, you are. Here you are. Oh, my gosh. We're so glad to see your face. Senator, I can turn it over to you. I'm sorry to disappoint you to be in person. But... No, <laughs> we're thrilled you're here in person. Well, virtual person. Well, Jamie, first of all, I, I, I joined and listened to part of what Senator Van Hollen said and uh, the, we, we are in total agreement. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the work on the uh, that's happening in the Environment and Public Works Committee and the work of our subcommittee on infrastructure because it's all positive. I mean, I, look, we have a historic opportunity. I, uh, uh, President Biden's State of the Union address, his, his conversation with the American people, give us all great hope. Uh, the president has laid out a vision for America. And he's done it in a way that it's achievable. And if you don't believe that, look at the American Rescue Plan, one of the most consequential bills ever passed by Congress. And it was done in the first 50 days of the Biden administration. So he is laser focused on the priority areas, which include what CCAN is fighting for, and that is America's leadership in America and globally on the climate issue. And every one of the agencies is working in that direction. I, 
going to have a conversation tomorrow with Bill Nelson because uh, that's some issues I need to talk with him as a NASA uh, administrator. But I know that NASA is refocusing its mission to be a positive player in regards to climate. And they do a lot of space science information that helps us in understanding uh, what we can do uh, in science uh, to protect uh, our, our globe, global from global warming. So every agency, Department of Defense is working on this. Every agency is under direction from the President of the United States to laser focus on these issues. And I, I, I don't know whether Senator Van Hollen mentioned or not the CRA that passed yesterday by a, a significant margin, the methane gas regulation that was uh, put in or deregulation that was put in by President Trump is no longer. Uh, we're gonna get that uh, eliminated and it's gonna be one of the most significant impacts on uh, greenhouse gases of anything that could be done. It, it's the low hanging fruit and we're gonna, we're gonna take that and and be able to use that to show the progress made here in America. And then I could tell you about the hearing we had in the Senate Finance Committee, which is not necessarily the most friendly committee in the world on some of these issues. And, and we had a, a really good uh, discussion on the energy taxes as it relates to dealing with climate change. How can we make the code friendly to achieving our objective? Also, just continue on good news before we get to the realities of the, of the membership of the Senate and, and how things are going to get done. Uh, the Environmental Public Works Committee, we're going to pass a bill that's going to have a very strong climate section in it. It's going, to, it's going to include adaptation. It's going to include electric vehicle charging stations. It's going to include runoff challenges that we have. It's going to include water uh, resiliency and research. And uh, we did that today in the bill that passed. Has water really, uh, the bill that passed the Senate today by an overwhelming majority has, you know, for our water infrastructure, resiliency, research, and affordability all are built into this. So I am optimistic that we're thinking big we have, have the mindset that we can get it done. We have the track record where we got it done on the American Rescue Plan. And yes, understand what Senator Van Hollen is saying. We gotta be strategic. So yes, we're going to work as hard as we can to get the broadest possible support for every element of this package. And it'll be earnest and we will negotiate in good faith, we will. We don't expect to win 100% of our battles, but we expect to achieve our objective, be able to move the issue forward in a meaningful way. And we're gonna have a short time frame for this because we're not gonna let them win by killing the clock in the session and we'll act. And that's where it's important for us to have the unity of every member of our caucus if we're gonna need to move on a partisan basis, which. We were, which we were required to do under the rescue plan and may very well be necessary in regards to a significant part of the other two packages, the American Jobs Plan and the American Family Plan. So you all know President Biden's uh, leadership and what he did by executive order, what he did by uh, convening the climate summit, what he did by uh, the, his commitment on, on where we're gonna be in 2035. I could go over all that with you and how we're gonna get there. But uh, quite frankly, uh, we know we can achieve those goals. Uh, we have a, a clear direction. We had a hearing this week with Administrator Regan of the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, who is a very, uh, uh, he's a person who brings us all together. He's really, a really good administrator. And he, the Republicans couldn't find anything, any fault in his logic as to how we can reach these goals. So I'm really excited. I, I really do think we have a, a really good chance to make progress. And last point I'll make, and I'll open up to your questions. See, Ken, you do, you've done a great job. We had a very tough last four years with the person in the White House and the control of the Senate uh, by Republicans. And yet, when you look at it, we suffered damage because of President Trump's executive orders, make no mistake about it. But we held the line in the Congress. We didn't lose ground. We didn't make up ground where we should have. We lost time, no question about it. We should have done a lot more, make no mistake about it. But we were able to, to at least uh, uh, live to fight another day. Well, the other day is, the next day is now, and now is the time to make the progress we need to. And I tell you, we're energized to do it. 
And uh, I am convinced that President Biden will um, uh, be there demanding that we get it done. And Senator Schumer is going to hear from a lot of us. Uh, he, he, he has a game plan. He's with us. Uh, we're we're going to have votes on the floor of the Senate. We're not going to win them all, but we're, we're going to make progress. And uh, yes, I agree with Senator Van Hollen. Our current practice on the floor of the Senate cannot, cannot stand. We, we have to take up issues. We have to vote on issues. Uh, we have to see what, where we can get uh, 50 votes in, uh, in our caucus uh, to change these procedures because the current procedures are not working. Thank you so much for all of that. I love what you said. <laughs> the next day is now. Like this is the fight for our lives. This is the final stretch. Well, obviously we'll keep going, but this is a sprint. In that context, and you said there's gonna be votes on the Senate floor. I was wondering if you could tell us any estimates of timelines that you have for when you think this policy might pass um, through the Senate uh, or out of your committee. So there are a couple competing issues for, for major floor time in the Senate. One of them is clearly the American Jobs uh, Plan, which will include a good part of the climate issues that we're talking about. The other is We the People, which is an extremely important process issue that we really have to get done by the August recess if we can implement the changes in time for the 2022 elections. So they're the two big issues that we need to bring to the floor of the Senate, hopefully getting both of those issues through the Senate. And I hope through that, when it gets through the Senate, it might be the last hurdle before it goes to the president uh, and get them to the president by, by before the August recess. I think that's our time frame. but I want you to know we the people is critically important to get done also by that time. That's fundamental to our democracy. Uh, and it's a bill that I, if, if you're not totally familiar and engaged on that, believe me, your agenda depends very much on us passing We the People Act. It's a critically important part of uh, a transformational change in America. It allows people to actually vote and express their will. Well, yeah, we endorse the We the People Act entirely as the people. Um, and we are thrilled to hear that you hope to get both that and the American Jobs Plan passed through the Senate by the August recess. I know that's a really uh, ambitious yeah, time. We don't know how we're getting it off the floor of the Senate. We're going to vote on it. And this is vote, by then. Vote. Hopefully, hopefully we'll have a, by then, you know, part of the strategy is to, is to challenge those that have problems to come up and participate in the process. If they do, then maybe we find common ground. If they don't, then it consolidates the Democrats and we move on our own if we have to. Senator Chris Van Hollen spoke to this um, during his remarks, but of all the pieces of the American Jobs Plan, why do you think it's important that Biden is including a 100% clean electricity standard? Well, for, for, for several reasons. First of all, it's doable. Second of all, it creates jobs. This is an easy one. I, I, I hate to say it this way, it's almost low hanging fruit also. This is something that is, is achievable. We're good at it. It brings jobs back to America, makes America more competitive. It has strong support from many of the stakeholders. This is not a divisive issue. Uh, and it, it really shows the global community that America is really back and serious. And it puts much more pressure on the other Emitter, major uh, emitters of the world, countries, to really step up to the plate and do something. So it puts pressure on China, puts pressure on Russia, puts pressure on EU. EU already has a pretty strong plan, but it puts pressure on some of the major country, uh, countries in our own hemisphere. Uh, so it, it, it is uh, really the, the, the way to unlock uh, the global uh, commitment. And in the meantime, it also makes America stronger, creates more jobs, makes us more competitive, all of the above. Wow, I love that answer. And I agree with everything that you just said. You heard me ask the last question of Senator Chris Van Hollen, what do you think Marylanders can do to help this pass? And so everyone on the call knows once, uh, as soon as Senator Cardin is off, we're gonna talk about what we can do to help not just in Maryland. Our, as you can hear, our two senators are 100% in support of 100% and the American Jobs Plan, but what we can do to help get the rest of the Senate delegation there but Senator Cardin, what advice do you have for us as we're trying to help you do your job? 
Uh, you know, stay focused on the agenda. There's a lot of things that are going on. Stay focused on your agenda. Broaden the support the best that you can. Uh, keep it before the American people as an urgent issue that needs to be dealt with now. Explain the reasons why that's true. You know, provide the validation as to why this issue is such a high priority of, of President Biden and such a high priority for uh, for us to get get done. Uh, and then I want to tell you, just urge you to reach out uh, to our um, uh, to, to our national stakeholders who are all part of this coalition uh, to get the this once in um, easily a generation opportunity uh, to move this nation to where it needs to be, whether it's in the voting systems, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in uh, fairness in our tax code, whether it's dealing with systemic uh, challenges and racism. This is our once in a generation time. Recognize that at the end of the day, we need to be strategic. And I give you by way example of the American Rescue Plan. Now everybody's celebrating today we got that done. There was a moment when we were negotiating and lost on the $15 uh, minimum wage, and we had uh, some problems about providing funds in some directions that people weren't totally happy. We almost fractured. We almost lost that. So don't let us get fractured. Don't draw a line where we can't win. Respect the talent of Nancy Pelosi, of Chuck Schumer, of uh, President Biden, respect their talent here and give them the space they need to produce results. Now, if we don't produce results, it's fair game, but give us the opportunity to produce results and give us the space that we need. But your job is to say, this is what we need. Push the envelope as far as you can. Don't compromise among yourself, but recognize that if we are able, to reach some agreements, or we do a strategy that may divide some of these into different parts, that decision has not been made yet or not. Believe me, it has not been made. But as that's the only strategy we can get to keep unity in our caucus, then be understanding of those decisions when they're made real time so we don't become fractured. Well, thank you so much, Senator Ben Cardin. I know you have an event after this. Your, your schedule also is, of course, packed. Uh, so we, we were just so thrilled to have your presence with us tonight. My pleasure. And again, thank you all for what you're doing. Stay well, everybody. You too. Um, well, we're going to take that charge seriously to keep this uh, front and center issue in the American people's mind. And to help us do that, I'm going to turn it over to Quentin Scott. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, so we've been talking tonight about the American Jobs Plan, which is an historic investment to reimagine and rebuild a new robust economy. We've already heard so many exciting aspects of the plan from both our senators and panelists. We've been building towards this moment for the last 20 years. Now we have the right people in place to tackle this climate crisis head on. So the question now, as Jamie has been asking both the senators, what can Marylanders do? We need you to join the fight and make calls to your fellow Americans in places like West Virginia. If you've been watching any cable news, you know Senator Manchin is a key pivotal vote uh, for the American Jobs Plan. We need to make sure that West Virginians are speaking up and letting Senator Manchin know that the American Jobs Plan is good for all of us. CCAN is partnering with organizations in West Virginia, conducting daily phone banks to talk with voters about the importance of infrastructure and climate. I have included a link in the chat so you can sign up now. Your calls will make a tremendous difference and help pass the American Jobs Plan. This is our moment. Let's do everything we can today and build a better tomorrow. I'll see you on the phones. Sign up now. Um, thank you for that, Quentin. Yes, we're not just going to sit here and congratulate ourselves about how great we are. We're going to get roll up our sleeves, pick up the phones, and get to work. So please, if you want to help get this passed, the number one thing we can do is get West Virginians to talk to Mansion. And the number one thing you can help to do that is to uh, click that link that Sh Quentin shared. Now, um, we're honored to be graced by the presence of Delegate Charcutian. Um, many of the programs you're hearing about tonight are going to be administered by the states. The federal government will often allocate money to certain issues and then charge the states with determining the best way to use those funds. And with all due respect to the senators we just heard from, in terms of lawmakers, we may have saved the best for last. 
So to tell us more about what we will suddenly become possible in Maryland with the American Jobs Plan, we have Delegate Sharkur Tudian, who does a great job of representing Montgomery County's District 20 in Annapolis. Anyone who has worked with her can tell you she is a one in a million legislator who consistently passes groundbreaking climate bills. Delegate Sharkudian, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you. It's such an honor to be here and thank you to CCAN and our senators and President Pine and Secretary King. Um, so, you know, as soon as I started hearing about the American Jobs Plan, as soon as the pieces started coming together, I started making the wish list. And so I've got this wish list that's been building in my head for Maryland, all these issues we've been trying to work on and we've made progress. We've made some really good progress in the state and we still have so far to go. And so what I'm gonna share with you tonight is just some, some real specifics. I think that Secretary Pines and, and, and um, I'm sorry, President Pines and Secretary King gave us kind of a broad overview of what's possible. And I wanna help folks picture specifically what we might do, the issues that have been in front of the General Assembly, that this will be a shot in the arm if I can take um, the other metaphor of, of the other really important thing we're doing right now, getting everyone vaccinated. So I wanna start with talking about offshore wind. Offshore wind is extraordinary in terms of its power as a, as a in terms of how powerful it is as an energy source. It's got a really high capacity factor, which is really important. Um, and it goes through the night, uh, it goes through periods of time when the sun isn't shining. So it's really important that we get offshore wind moving. They are also union jobs. And so these are jobs that are already union jobs. And so when we talk about what are the jobs we wanna invest in, what are the industries we wanna invest in, offshore wind has to be front and center. Unfortunately, Maryland has gotten behind on the offshore wind front because it's still an emerging technology. It's a little more expensive and we've been caught up in um, some problems both in the state and, and with federal permitting. And so really looking forward to offshore wind and the transmission lines that are necessary to grow offshore wind further being a big piece of what we do um, with these funds. The second thing I wanna highlight is energy efficiency, but specifically low income energy efficiency. And so this is one of the issues where we have a real inequity in the state. We've been making good progress, sort of chugging away at 2% improvement for energy efficiency on average residences across, uh, across the state over the last several years. But when we break it out and we look at the energy efficiency gains for low income individuals, what we see is it is limping along at 0.05%, 0.04%, 0.1%. And it's unconscionable that we have a, a set of strategies that can both improve efficiency, use less energy, but also lower the energy burden for folks who are struggling the most to pay their energy bills and improve air quality for individuals who are struggling most with health issues, with asthma and with, with other issues that are tied to combusting fossil fuels inside and uh, mold and, 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 and those kinds of things. And so when we think about what we could do in terms of energy efficiency overall improving, but specifically making a massive investment in low income energy efficiency in the state. And we, we've tried to make some progress on that. We haven't yet in the state and this infusion of money would make a big difference. Um, it's also an area that we can grow good uh, local businesses, small businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, veteran owned businesses. So there's a lot of potential for wealth building in that area as well. When we look at public transit, um, we can really move uh, so much in this area in terms of equity and emissions. Um, just this past year, we passed a bill that will affect the, um, it basically is a catch up bill. It puts a lot of money into public transit, but it basically catches us up to all of the uh, maintenance and safety issues that have been ignored for so long. And so we're sort of just catching up on where we should have been. And this infusion of funds from the federal government can get the red line back on track. Um, no pun intended, it can get, extend our mark system um, from more regular mark to, uh, uh, to the Frederick and, and Western Maryland um, to, to, so we don't have to widen highways. Um, so we can take widening highways off the, off the table. Um, Southern Maryland, uh, there's a real need for, for rail and better transit um, into Southern Maryland and, um, and uh, also to electrify the fleet um, more generally across the board. Um, 
I want to talk a little bit about decarbonizing buildings that was that's been mentioned. Um, again, here's an area where geothermal and we just passed a big geothermal bill this year. Again, union jobs on the bigger projects um, really important. We work together with with folks fo focusing on equity, focusing on union jobs um, and decarbonizing buildings. And there's a lot more that we can do with that, looking at the overall um, uh, natural gas grid and actually transitioning the natural gas grid to district geothermal systems. Massachusetts is looking at some pilots in this area and it's the kind of thing that if we had a major federal investment um, we could really start exploring that in the state. Uh, on the issue of grids, the Public Service Commission is starting to look at the issue of the, the of, of planning around the distribution grid. If we invest more in the distribution grid, we can do more to both ensure that we have resiliency and reliability, which are issues that Texas really has highlighted for us. They need to make sure we're doing those investments right. Um, but also we can optimize our distributed energy resources, our solar and our storage, making sure that we're targeting those to the communities where then we can be most likely to, for example, um, shut down coal plants. I'm targeting those to the communities that need resiliency um, because they have sort of weaker systems and do that in a way that uh, minimizes costs to rate payers. Some really interesting work we can do there. And finally, I just want to mention that we have um, teed up this year, we passed legislation to tee up um, the Maryland Clean Energy Center as a green bank. So it's ready and waiting for the federal funds for, for green bank funds. Um, and it will be in a position um, to really be able to take those funds and then support the leveraging of the private capital uh, for, for green investments in the state. Um, I could go on. I have my list of the State Highway Administration bikeable, walkable areas that need improvement. I'm excited for those funds. Um, I will stop there and I'm happy to take a couple of questions if there are any. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, when we had to think about what lawmaker in Maryland really has that wish list of like, if we could just get more money, what could we put that funds into? Delegate Charcuti and you were the first to come to mind. And yeah, exa the examples you gave, I think are dead on where that program to expand energy efficiency to low income folks. I think the only reason it didn't move forward is from a lack of funds um, this session. And if we just had those funds, um, it would have moved forward. And so hopefully now um, we will have those funds. If folks have questions for Delegate Charcoutian, um, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we can ask them of the delegate. But first I wanna cut to a 15 second video of President Biden at his incredible speech last night to a joint session of Congress, um, speaking about 100% clean electricity um, he uses the words, it's important to fully clean the grid. And we're just really glad that not only are we talking about this and our two US senators are talking about this, but our president is talking about this when he has the ear of the nation. Um, do we have that video queued up? The American Jobs Plan will create jobs that lay thousands of miles of transmission lines needed to build a resilient and fully clean grid. We can do that. Beautiful, beautifully put, uh, we can do that. Just like Senator Cardin said, that is now low hanging fruit, what used to feel like it was impossible. Um, so if you have questions for Delegate Charcutian, please feel, to put, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but I'm gonna make a plug again to, to pick up the phone and call folks in West Virginia. Everything that we're talking about hinges on Manchin voting for it. Um, so yeah, Quentin just put that link in the chat again. Quentin, do you want to say anything else about the importance of that phone banking? Yeah, it seems like we already have a few folks that signed up. So excited that uh, people are already recognizing that this is our moment. Uh, we can't say enough that uh, West Virginia is going to be a pivotal uh, point uh, or Manch is going to be a pivotal vote uh, in upcoming here. And so we want to make sure that we're making that outreach uh, to West Virginia voters so they can put that pressure uh, on Mansion, uh, we're doing some other work on the ground, doing petitions and uh, organizing with other organizations, and we're really excited. And we're building a movement uh, in West Virginia, and we want Melliners to help us out with that effort. So sign up. I'm already glad a few ha have already, and just let's keep building forward. The time frame, because someone asked in the chat, is that we're going to be doing this phone banking for a long time. It's led by our partners by West Virginia. We're just driving to their actions. Um, so yeah, week, month, months ahead 
But there's a question for Delegate Charcutian. What are the impediment, impediments to offshore wind that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, so two, uh, two things that I would highlight. The first is that um, for the 400 megawatts that was approved like now, I don't know, almost eight or nine years ago, um, they have just been slow walked for a number of reasons. Our current governor in Maryland uh, and the Maryland Energy Administration really have been pandering to um, the folks in Ocean City who have been trying to block it. And so combination of um, sort of maneuvers with slowing things down at the Public Service Commission, um, which has then also in, in my mind sent sort of a negative message to offshore wind developers about how friendly or unfriendly as the case may be Maryland is to offshore wind. So, um, so that's a piece of it. Um, we've sort of worked through a lot of that. Um, and then we have an additional challenge of uh, at, the, at the federal level, um, under uh, the previous president, uh, we had uh, there were some there were some permitting issues. So that is all being straightened out and streamlined and moved very quickly. Um, but in the meantime, while you know the Public Service Commission, uh, the, the administration, the Maryland uh, Hogan's administration have been slow walking um, this first 400 megawatts, the General Assembly approved another 1,200 megawatts. Um, and that is in the process of being bid on right now at the Public Service Commission. So in the next few years, hopefully that will grow. Um, and so we should be proud of that. But while we've been moving on now to try to get to roughly 1600 megawatts, we've got uh, Virginia and, and New Jersey moving forward with 6,000, 7,000, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind and really demonstrating to us what's possible in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and so I think it really um, uh, challenges us in the state to one, address some of these administrative pieces that the, you know, getting the, the governor to step aside and let the process move forward. Um, but the other is as a, from a broader policy perspective um, at the General Assembly really moving, I think we can do so much more than, than 1600 megawatts. Um, and then a piece of it is the transmission lines, which it's, it's kind of cool that that was the, I mentioned that, that that was the clip that you picked because we do need probably, I, I'd have to look at what exactly the numbers are, but to, you, as you build more and more, offshore wind, we don't have the transmission lines necessarily to bring that into the state. So that has some PJM planning sort of pieces as well, but it's all very doable. Well, thank you for that. That's just about all the time we have in our last 60 seconds. I just wanna thank everyone for joining. I wanna thank our, our panelists again um, and everyone who participated in this 100% clean electricity by 2035 is the linchpin to rapid decarbonization, especially when coupled with a plan like the American Jobs Plan or the Thrive Agenda, which was introduced today. These are gonna be game-changing investments for Maryland. And it's going to make a profound influence on our state and likely impact your quality of life. I know maybe, I'm hoping to get a sidewalk in my neighborhood from all this funding to walkable communities. Um, I hope we can all get something out of this. Let's go win the American Jobs Plan. Let's get this thing passed. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>